So, Fergus, thanks very much. Thanks very much for uh, sharing your time, obviously. We're, we are in lockdown. This is an interesting time, not just for us in our field, but obviously for you, obviously, in the media and the, in the kind of the, in the journalist field uh, as well. Um, just to kind of, just so that everyone knows, obviously, uh, Fergus Bell, you are founder and CEO of Fathom. Uh, you are uh, experienced and sort of been in the digital sphere since you entered uh, journalism uh, as well. Uh, years back, obviously, as a social media and UGC editor with the Associated Press, uh, you've uh, been with a variety of different international organizations, many media startups as well. Now, today, founder and CEO of uh, Fathom. Uh, and obviously, importantly, as well, it's worth pointing out that uh, you are equally a, a board member of uh, the online uh, news uh, association. The one thing, as I mentioned to you, that, that, that it, it, I think people in communication, so very much on the other side of the fence, are interested in, uh, is that subject of misinformation. But, but I think importantly, not just of the impact that it might not have on them, but actually kind of trust uh, and so on. But I think it's worth really starting at the beginning, given obviously the work that, that you'd been involved with in the past, uh, and that kind of aspect of misinformation and how you came across it first and how kind of it shaped your, your career, your job, your fact-finding and, and, and verifying. Sure. Hi. Um, yes, I, I, I guess I've been doing verification work, which is, was the, the precursor to misinformation work for quite a long time. So this for me started when I was at the Associated Press and, and I was working on videos coming out of the Arab Spring, mm -hmm. uh, places like Egypt, uh, try, and no one at that point knew how to find people who, who were in places of interest, who were involved in things. Uh, social media was starting to become a way that people could share information about that, uh, about where they were from, uh, where they were, where they, where they were from, what, what they were seeing. And so from a journalistic point of view, uh, that's, that's where that kind of movement of social media verification uh, starts to come about. That then led to more structured processes around user-generated content, uh, working out whether something was true or, true or not from the, from the place we thought it was from or not, um, and also within the context that we thought. Since then, we've, we've seen a, a split and then a convergence uh, again, and, and that is um, fact-checking was, was a separate thing, and that we had the verifiers and we had the fact checkers. The verifiers and the fact checkers were doing very different things. Now we're starting to see them come together because their crossover is uh, is obvious. Mm -hmm. um, but we're also seeing this kind of misinformation ecosystem. This idea that misinformation can be used um, to win elections. It can be used on platforms. Misinformation strategies are a thing. Uh, as our disinformation strategies. So we've seen a, a, a kind of boom in this environment and there's opportunities for, for everyone to be able to fight it and track it and uh, limit the impact, um, but there are also risks for everyone. So uh, that's, a, that's a summary of, of almost 10 years in a, in yeah. a, in a few minutes. I mean, I, I remember the formation of the user-generated content desk at the BBC. That was 10, 11, 12 years ago. And the brief insight that I had back then was very much about that, about the user-generated content. And I think at that time, misinformation and disinformation wasn't really even, a, 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 on the digital sphere, wasn't really even an area of concern. And if it was, it appeared to be more within the political environment. Now, of course, we seem to, we seem to be, obviously, that subject cemented itself in the political environment wherever you are around the world. Um, obviously, my work takes me to Southeast Asia, obviously, uh, and, and before that in, uh, in the GCC. Um, but, but obviously, it's equally moved into more of the corporate uh, area as well. Where do you find, uh, you know, or in some way from, from, from the media side, do, do you see organizations, media organizations, having to uh, invest a lot more time and resource in the fact-checking and in the verifying of content not just for any story that might be political, but equally anything that, that, that is corporate as well, where the corporates will have to go through the 
ne necessarily sign off or traditional press releases, financial announcements or, or so on. So in terms of resources, kind of. Um, I think it's very clear that the, the, the news and journalism industry isn't flush with cash at the moment. Mm -hmm. um, but what we have seen in terms of a shift in resources is it used to be someone like me sitting in the corner of the room doing this. Mm -hmm. Now it's a part of everyone's responsibility to do this. And, and news organizations are launching fact check products. Mm -hmm. uh, there is a, a separate journalistic fact check community uh, who who follow very, very strict standards and are very good at information sharing in terms of the latest uh, debunks or the latest processes for doing that. Um, so that those are the kind of internal products. And then we've seen this shift as standards are brought into organizations to assess everything that passes through that organization to see that it meets the standard. A standard so that does involve things like analyzing press releases and analyzing statistics or if statistics are mentioned or claims are made to fact check those in the same process that uh, using the same process that a journalist reporting uh, on their beat would have to do for anything they come across have you seen on the point of statistics have you seen more an increase say from I would say even a corporate but equally a political side uh, with my own experience of working, you know, within the UK government of there are more stories that are built on statistics, but therefore if they come from a, a corporate environment, there's lies, damn lies and statistics. So you have to invest more. I think the FT recent position with regards to using statistics has been fantastic. But, but how do you find that being able to break those statistics apart in order to verify what's being shared is, is true? Really simply ask for the raw data. Okay. ask for the report that the statistic came from mm -hmm. uh i mean everyone knows that statistics can be used to tell the story that you want mm -hmm. uh, but if you're interacting with journalists then i'm sorry but you're not necessarily going to get the story that you want mm -hmm. um you're going to get the story that that is there um so sharing original source material is going to be essential and i would not be surprised if if their people are increasingly being asked for that and okay. from a journalistic point of view they should be um and then i guess kind of understanding that if you're going to share results then so, or results or statistics people will dive into that and just check to see what angle you've put on it because you can a, a, a true you don't have to fake numbers to selectively use them to to tell the story that you want. Mm -hmm. It's just important to to be transparent about what you're sharing. Um, and I think we we've seen an understanding of that from both sides in a lot of cases, and no understanding as well. I, I mean, and certainly there's a point that you mentioned earlier. Obviously, the media industry, the news industry as well, and I'm loath to say industry in some way because it, it is an essential part of of society journalism. Uh, is it's not a wash with money. It's not a wash with investment as well, because those people that 10 to 20 years ago would pick up a copy of a newspaper, would watch uh, news online from credited sources from across a political spectrum, but they, they still had that authenticity there. Now, obviously, since the rise of the, of the social media uh, giants, um, Facebook, Twitter, for example, are, are, are some, but equally forums uh, as well, uh, those eyeballs have gone elsewhere. Um, how do you find that they are getting their own stories, might not be fact-checked, but their own stories from other sources affecting their interaction with uh, news organizations that, 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 you know, rightly so carry that professional gravitas? That's a really difficult point to address because the way that people consume news and the choice that people have has fundamentally changed mm -hmm. you are served news algorithmically now a lot of people are uh, and it, you don't receive uh, an editor's breakdown of what what is the most important story of the day you also get served algorithmically content that is of interest to you um, not necessarily timely not necessarily um, have the same standards that editorial operations have developed over time and hold themselves uh, up to. That's both a good thing because you get what you want, but a bad thing because 
in a way you you see something on a screen and you might compare it to to something of a higher quality or with higher higher editorial standards or higher values around transparency of sourcing um, when that comparison can't be made so it looks the same but it's not the same and i think that's the dangerous part and and perhaps people don't fully grasp that if they see something in the same platform it's not necessarily of the same quality or integrity and how do you find obviously the the influence on reputation and the trust in the media organization i'm, I'm coming at this from organizations corporate and others who obviously still have to have and rightly have to have a good working relationship with media organizations who want to amplify their story but obviously if communities are out there are looking to um, uh, challenge their authority or their specific position uh, how do you feel that that relationship is working again it leads me to a separate question in a minute more about what do organizations need to consider uh, on that but before that you know what, what would your answer be I would say that I imagine that things aren't aren't necessarily worse than they than they were kind of previously, but I would say that there is massive room for improvement. Mm -hmm. Journalists and news organisations are on the front end on, on the, of the issue of trust. They've had a huge blow to the to how trustworthy they are, and. They are, whether that was their fault or not, that's a whole other discussion, but they are as good as the facts of their story and if they hold up. And if those facts, or, or if there is trouble coming from a source of the story that someone through some process of communications has got to them and there is a problem, the journalists are the ones that will take the beating for it initially. So it is important for that relationship with those, um, with, people in the communications industry to be as accurate as possible to not put journalists in that situation. And that is the way you, that you improve that relationship. No one wants to be made a fool of in reporting something that, that they have been assured is true and that they have done their checks. And um, I, I think there has also been a shift in the way that, that news is produced and quiet news days. There is not that need to go looking for a story, an easy story now. Mm -hmm. Whereas I think that, that that was the case on slow news days, finding news is not a problem. Um, and so there's not, you don't, there's, and maybe this is a very bad view of kind of PRs. There's not that need to have a press release land on your desk at the right time and be like, oh, that's, that's the bit that's gonna fill that page or that segment of the evening news. Okay. Um, actually, we don't, it, it's more, if it's a high value story, that's going to be, that's going to have value all the way through the chain. Do, do you find, I mean, on, on that perspective that obviously say on the, on the communication side of the fence, the public relations communication side of the fence, that obviously those old ways of trying to put a story out, you know, on a slow news day, for example, uh, or today's, you know, good news to bear, today's a good news to bury bad news. You know, today's a good day to bury bad news is, is the old saying, because, there is so much, so many platforms, even for news organizations, that that rule really doesn't apply. Whenever a story breaks, it can be at any time because there needs to, there needs to be a lot more internal insight by communicators within, within their own organizations and equally the hearsay that's being shared outside. Yes, and there is also an audience who are motivated and engaged and will seek out you know, intentions behind things, analyze that quite rightly. Um, and I think that's a wonderful, um, a wonderful development that audiences have that direct interaction and we can see that interaction and it has to hold everyone to a higher standard. You can't slip something through because someone will point it out. Um, yeah. And in a busy newsroom, you may not have had time to point it out or you're reporting the news, but there's lots of people who, who do have the time to point that out and and that means everyone has to work to a to a higher standard to make sure that that things aren't slipping through the net that shouldn't so so the external stakeholders of an organization if they have a, a, a digital footprint themselves they'll obviously not just be following that organization they'll be following the journalists as well because they'll ideally want the tip from the journalist rather than from the media organization 
but equally if something does flip through they go ah i this person is also saying this let me uh, share it so you've got more from the journalist side not just your internal network of contacts but you've got those others around that can obviously further uh, give you additional insight not just others our the stakeholders in our product yeah. um so so we we have them and and also we live in a world where source material if it exists if it's public can be found by people and um and discussed and so if a statistic going back to the statistic yeah. you know, maybe because it's it's the kind of low-hanging fruit in this argument if a full statistic is used it's pretty easy to find the for anyone to be able to find that source material they expect audiences expect the journalists to have worked from it and, and by turn audience uh, journalists will expect quick and easy access to that data if it is being presented to them um, as, a, as a press release do you think that the level of uh, uh, presenting statistics for example for a story is at a level playing field or at, at a level between how journalists and data scientists would use within a newsroom to that within more corporate organizations when they use statistics in a very different way? Um, I, I do think that they're completely Who is more forensic about, about the, the scientists are more forensic around around data. Um, I've done work with with science journalists and, and identifying some of the challenges that science journalists have and, and actually one of the things that they've identified is if you're looking at res a research paper uh, and you're the journalist, the person in between is the press office or, yeah. uh, and, and that person in between may have interpreted the data to be able to get the story to the journalists yeah. or pick out the headlines when actually, but I think what we're seeing is specialist science journalists would actually really love to dive into the data and they're building up expertise that we've got really strong um, data journalists now. We've got people who can uh, crunch numbers, who can analyze this in a way that is right, forensic, yeah. but they need that access. Um, but of course, a, a, a scientist looks at the numbers for, for their purposes in a, in a far more forensic way um, because, they're look, because they've got a different outcome. Uh, what would be great is to, for two sides to talk about what they need and and, um, and what the others need. And, and there's a really good example of, of an organization doing that, which is The Conversation, who turn, whose contributors are all academics and scientists, mm -hmm. um, and they are writing news stories, writing stories about research and about current issues from that perspective. Obviously, we know that kind of within a newsroom, the, the, you know, the shape of the newsroom and the roles within a newsroom have developed as obviously digital and social has taken hold uh, of, of the way of living uh, and the way of working as well. Do you think the same could be said about those within, within the communications function on the other side of the fence? Have they still, have they stuck to the media relations, copywriting, uh, events and so on? Uh, or have they also invested into that more forensic ability to look at data and so on? I know within government, obviously, statistics have to generally, generally confirm, or they do have to conform to ONS standards and so on, but within more outside of government, what is your view? Are we, uh, is the comms community having to, is it going to need to change and, and upskill itself in order to be able to better engage and better um, uh, avoid any issues of we're hiding this or there's misinformation or so on. Um, I'm not. I'm not. At the, I'm not sitting in an, on a news desk at the moment, making seeing that that kind of stream or or, or or that process. And so, I can only really kind of talk about it from the from the widest possible view. But like the media industry or like the the news industry there you are kind of judged by the worst person in the room okay. um, and you get lumped together as an industry and so how often do we hear people blame the media or journalists when it's a bad when something bad happens and I and I think there is a 
a growing movement that understands that the industry has to come together around trust and trust indicators and trust standards. Yeah. I, I anecdotally, I would say that that's probably true for um, public relations and communications as well. You're still potentially lumped in with with those rotten eggs that, that yeah. have, have acted badly. And I can list off a whole load of anecdotes that I've heard from newsrooms that say, we are now going to, we, we ran a story and it turned out that it was false or that figure was used and we look, and we got called on it and it's false. We will not be taking any press releases from them anymore. We will block their email addresses. Yeah. Uh, from, and we will, and we will say that no one can, can run a story uh, from them. So that is still happening. Um, but then I would also, to, from that wider point of view, you know, we talk about the newsroom. You talk about corporate newsrooms. They, they're, they're, you're, there's a world where, where the actions of one side of this industry replicate some of those processes uh, from the other. Um, I don't believe that those processes are in place in corporate newsrooms because mm -hmm. They're only still just being developed and solidified and coming out with best practice in uh, journalistic newsrooms. Okay. So, and I and I think the two probably feed off each other. So we can't be possibly at that at that stage where you have all of those structures for identifying misinformation. I know that there are. I've heard anecdotes of crisis response, of monitoring, of, of all of this, but I. I there are things that we are that I am discovering every day around fact checking and misinformation where these things are not written up yet they're not they're not wide, widely used as best practice because we're coming up with new things as new things emerge um, so I would be surprised because the news industry hasn't even rolled all of this out yet or, or nowhere near rolled it out so um, I would I would suggest possibly that, that it couldn't possibly have happened that quickly yet. And in some way, obviously you focus on that, you know, vital point, which, which is about trust. Yes, there is trust in the media and that's obviously being challenged. There's obviously, obviously always been the trust within communications professionals because you're trying to establish that narrative, that view, that perception in, in a certain way. And obviously in the whole environment of, of digital and, and social, you know, and it feels like an eternity that we've been in this area, um, that there, there, obviously there, there might still be a, a, a disconnect what would you what would i mean what kind of insight do you get say potentially from conversations from fellow members say from the o ona that that communications professional leaders uh, need to consider to make sure that what is a good corporate newsroom these are the skills that they have to make sure that for that entity they are seen in a way in which the reputation is secured uh, and equally there isn't going to be a challenge on that what what kind of tips would you have would you give from the other side of the fence I would say that the corporate newsroom should be looking at verification processes and fact checking standards that newsrooms are implementing themselves, because ultimately anything coming from that other side will have to go through that process. You will be much, much more efficient as a corporate newsroom if you are uh, sharing information in a way that, that allows a journalist to analyze your your content quicker um, and, and meet those standards. Um, so, so I would say replicate those processes, make sure that there is training. Um, if you are, I think there were in the news industry, the work around social media at the beginning was farmed out to junior staffers. Yeah. Misinformation work, monitoring, I think in, in, communications in broadly in media broadly it's not necessarily seen as high level work mm -hmm. um in in all cases in all cases it should be it it's difficult work it requires experience you can't just you can't just hit the ground running you can't just say make sure that there's no misinformation or find the misinformation here misinformation campaigns uh, from outside state actors are incredibly complex. Mm -hmm. They have um, the methods that are used would will bring people in for no reason that you can see, but you can still be dragged into being a missing part of a misinformation campaign. There has to be solid learning. There has to be solid structures in place 
and there has to be kind of due credit given to the level of that work anywhere that you're you're working on it do you feel that with that in some way the relationship will improve not just obviously between uh, communicators and journalists which, which you know there are many organizations where, where that is strong and that does exist but, but equally I think between uh, uh, communicators and their organizations and the wider stakeholder um, uh, area and, and their specific audiences as well I, I do I do and, and I, I think there's always been this kind of this side and that side and you even you even phrased it that way earlier yeah. but actually there's a bigger a bigger issue here misinformation is the other side yes communicators are not communicators whatever whatever type of communication you're in which is it's direct indirect um corporate non-corporate actually misinformation disinformation is the other side is what we are all uh meant to be against and what a lot of us are against and what and what and that is a big enough fight without having kind of infighting or friction between people who are who ultimately are on the same side which is about getting information out there um, for a specific reason whatever and whatever that reason may be and obviously we're talking this in a very gen general uh, kind of view overseas culture plays a different uh and it's a kind of it's a, it's, it's a different but very important aspect to how local communities trust their leaders uh my work in in southeast asia uh kind of really for me highlights that but if you are, for example, in India, where social, even actually more of the messaging groups, the WhatsApp, Telegram, uh, and, and, and others, how do you then start to kind of factor those areas in where you can't listen, you can't monitor, you can't take insight, and then you can advise uh, as well? We even fact check. Certain news organizations are doing very well on fact check checking content that is being shared through WhatsApp groups. What, what, what can you tell us about uh, the importance of that and what kind of organizations, politi well, political, either community, or even corporate community can actually learn from that? There are, I mean, this is such a big field and, and it's changing so quickly. But a snapshot right now, I would say, make the assumption that you can't see. Okay. Um, but also your way of seeing what's going on is to form a, form a community so that people may share what they're seeing with you. Yeah. Um, you can't update something. Mm -hmm. You can't correct something. You have, your standards have to be so high to begin with if you put something out there. Um, but, but not just in terms of a statistic or in, in terms of... Um, or a claim or a fact or a piece of information it has to be right and it has to be shared in a in a way that matches that platform so because otherwise someone will turn that into something that is into a format that is shareable on that platform and that's not your way of doing it or that might not you you lose your control so what i mean here is if you put say you were to to do a a campaign on whatsapp uh you're going to share an image into WhatsApp with, with your campaign, which is going to be the best way to do it. Mm -hmm. If you've not made it, if you if you've not created a compelling enough piece of content that works for the people that it's going to be shared with, they'll just take the information, turn it into something that does because people are pretty smart. Yeah. So you get one shot. There is a lot of work to be done on investment in terms of formats that work um, to make sure that you are giving people what they want. Um, and tracking it is hard, but but verification is hard, They're, but but not impossible. So if you have a community, one thing that I've seen some people do is anything that they put out, they put a number on it, um, and it, on that number, it, that number can be cross referenced with with your website. Yeah. So you you put all of your WhatsApp messages or your visuals or your your campaigns, whatever you you host that somewhere on a platform that you own that is that can be verified. And if someone finds something without a number or with a number, yeah. they can go to your site and just cross-reference that that did actually come from you. Yeah. Super easy. Does not mess up with design very much. It's a verifier. I don't know why more people aren't doing it. So this is really more of, a, of a, you know, creating a, a very open and transparent uh, content library for uh, organizations so that they can quickly say, we've seen this, look, this is what we had. 
verify it or not. And then you, you let your community, rather than just the organization, the community debunk that. Yes, exactly. So we, we, a very early version of this was a project I worked on in Mexico called Verificado, where we were fact checking and verifying memes and claims and stats and quotes on, on WhatsApp. The, the way that we did it there was we said every single graphic or image or debunk that we sent back to you on WhatsApp will be tweeted, uh, will be tweeted by the official account and shared on the official Facebook page. If you do not see it there, it's not one of ours. Someone, this is not, this is not real. Someone has used the branding and fabricated it. If you yeah. do find it there, it is one of ours. It, ours. And that's the way that you check. And how do you find, therefore, that obviously the current processes with regards to that, that obviously media organizations are using, that com communication communities obviously are slowly developing as well. Th this sounds to me like there needs to be more a, a change in internal culture to, to make, to move possibly towards more transparent uh, behavior. Uh, is that something that you would see or? I, I think, I think it's essential that everyone moves to more transparent behavior. I don't, if you're still not working towards further transparency, then, then you're not doing the right job. But I also think that private messaging apps are way, way, way more personal than a lot of people realize. The way that people communicate on, on something like WhatsApp is one-to-one. -one. Um, and even if you are many, if you are one-to-many, and that's how you operate, yeah. the person on the other end still sees it as a one-to-one -one communication. And that's really not desirable for a lot of organizations who want to be able to create scalable content. But it's a huge opportunity, if you can get it right, to create that one-on-one -on -one, uh, feeling for someone. Because having been involved in projects like this, that is how people want to communicate and continue to, to engage with that process. Well, this report from Krull and Forrester late last year, and it was a, it was the, the story was carried by the Financial Times, mentioned obviously about how organizations are using uh, influencers and, and brand ambassadors in some way. But obviously this traditionally tends to be more in a very open, in a very open social media area rather than the messaging. Would your view be that there is, A, firstly, you need to verify their community uh, as well. There needs to be some due diligence there. But equally, that the best place for them is not so much just in the public, open social media, Facebook, Instagram, LinkedIn, Medium post, that, that kind of area, but equally on WhatsApp, Telegram, that, that's where they can really uh, you know, give additional support. My mind isn't made up about the role of influencers in, in, in this kind of yeah. space um, because I think influencers come about for completely different reasons. Yeah. One and influencers, um, influencer means something different to, to, to everyone. Um, you're never really going to adopt common standards across, across influencers. I think that ultimately though, I trust the audience and that the audience will start to understand people who they can trust because there will be natural trust indicators that start to come out from um, legacy communicators and new communicators that if and if it comes out from a, a new communicator the legacy organizations will will adopt it if it works but but I see that the, I think the audience will the market will shape that more than more than the industry that where where the influences may be coming from or, or uh, engaged by and with the work that you're doing, obviously, with Fathom, how, what are you doing there? Which is not just UK, but overseas. And how are you factoring that in? Is it generally more towards just news organizations overseas? Or is it also towards um, um, corporates uh, as well and, and in other areas? So our work touches um, newsrooms and anyone anyone that interacts with newsrooms is yeah. is kind of the so that that's audience work that's corporate work that any and, and we focus on the flow of information um the flow of accurate information i guess so uh, that can involve helping a newsroom bring bring 
in new or updated verification processes and standards. It may involve working with a corporate newsroom to do something similar um, in order to, to um, get their information at the, to, the, to the standard that a newsroom would need to pick up on mm -hmm. it. Um, we're also obviously in this kind of current climate looking at how to bring those parameters and structures that we've built up around optimizing trust to a distributed workforce. It's a lot easier to have a conversation with someone sitting next to you or spot something on someone else's screen as to flag up a warning to it's really difficult to make sure especially as misinformation gets even more advanced um it's really difficult to replicate those processes efficiently straight away in a distributed setting where people are working from home in different places don't you have to have sign, different sign off processes or, or or not different sign off processes, but really clear sign off processes um and that involves training um it involves setting up monitoring systems knowing what to monitor and that's a real-time situation that I always get asked, no matter who I'm speaking to, well, what tools would you recommend? And actually, there is, if there was a tool that I could recommend, I would have built it and I would be very rich by now. There is no tool. It's about process. And processes are tailored, unfortunately, to, to every single situation, to each organization, to, dependent on staff, size, setting, type of information they're dealing with. Again, in a world where scalable is really the word that everyone wants to hear, it's fighting misinformation, optimizing news and communications processes for trust is, is something that has to be done on a case-by-case -case basis. And in summary on the process, I, I'm assuming that also it's not just about having the right processes, but it's actually about having the right, as you say, training, but the right uh, behavior uh, as well. So that it, this is this is done by an organisation uh, in this way in order to protect their trust. The trust has to be the eyes of the community, the eyes of staff, colleagues are there to identify, bring up to attention to professionals, and then be able to react accordingly. Uh, how, how do you find to uh, how do you find the the, the the changing the internal thought on the risk? of misinformation to organizations at a senior level. And I asked this because obviously earlier on you mentioned, rightly so in my opinion, that social media, the management of social media was always farmed out to um, you know, a specific younger uh, people within the, you know, um, the community, you know. but, but, but now it's not. How do you change that mentality at, at the top? Engage them in the process. So when, whenever we are, when we're working with an organization we do our best to persuade whoever's engaged us to bring in the practitioners and the decision makers yeah. so that they hear from both sides as why they can't do something or why they should do something or the more junior kind of practitioners who have to implement the strategy know that they are doing that with the full sign off of the of the senior management an example would be in a newsroom yeah i don't want any misinformation uh, pass passing through my newsroom i don't want to, us to broadcast or publish anything that, that could be labeled as fake news with it okay okay oh um but then the next day hey um editor i see our competitors are running this right now why aren't we running it they've been running it for two hours and so uh, that's going to happen unless you engage that senior person in the process with the junior person to say, okay, this is our standard. We hold on it until it meets this specific standard for verification or, and, and to be honest, that's been, that's been very effective. And the places that don't do that are, are the ones that, that don't really make any change. And if there's three things that three pieces of advice that you would give, those who are thinking of establishing processes, those who are thinking, obviously, improving the way that they community, uh, you know, communicate and engage. What would they be? Create a process that you are happy with and that is informed by industry best practice. Make sure that um, anything that you produce is based on transparency 
Yeah. And I don't know what this. I think if you do those two, I think you'd be, I think you'd be off to a good start, to be honest. Yeah. No, I mean that. I, I think uh, I, I think you're. Uh, those are th those two are, are are central to 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 anything. Specifically, from you know my 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 area, my expertise is to develop uh, that trust and maintain that trust. And one thing is de developing it. The other thing is maintaining that 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 trust. Focus. We could be talking here for hours, uh, if not days, as we have in the past, Pan on panels or outside panels. Um, I wanted to thank you uh, just for sharing. Uh, we might come back to this subject later on on a, on a, on a different on a different day. Um, but look, thanks very much for that. Uh, I think hopefully people who watch this will be able to pick some uh, important points uh, out of this. But I know I'll share your contact details, obviously, so that people can get in touch with you if they do have any questions. So, uh, Fergus. Thanks very much uh, again.